Welcome to Bethlehem Lutheran Church and our video worship service for this day, the Lord's Day, May 17th of 2020. We welcome you and we are going to begin with a song across the lands. Greetings, Bethlehem Lutheran Church, on this sixth Sunday of Easter. Uh, it's so strange that we're in Easter tide still, and yet um, here I am in a church uh, surrounded by all these empty pews. But I give thanks to God that uh, we're still connected, we're still united in the body of Christ. And just as a reminder that we are still celebrating our Lord's resurrection, uh, I invite you to our Easter response Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the Lord, Lord Comfort and 
and defend us, gracious Lord. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown? This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines, made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things, from one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of our own poets have said. For we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that a deity is like gold or silver or stone an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Word of God, Word of Life. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Peter. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that it is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, 
the righteousness for the unrighteousness, unrighteous. In order to bring you to God, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were served through water and baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, though the res through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. yourself to us in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ. Embolden your church in every place to preach your gospel and to live it out daily. Especially, Lord, show us how to be your church in this time of relative quarantine and separation from one another. We pray for our church. heaven and earth, you love all things that you have made. 
make us good caretakers of your gifts in us and around us, that we may treat your creation with the dignity and care with which you treat all the things that you have made. We pray for your creation. give you thanks, O Lord, for the human creation, for your children throughout the world. Judge the nations justly, show mercy to the oppressed, and speak truth to those who would twist it for their own ends. Raise up prophets to call your people back to faith and care for others. We pray for the world. near to us when we are lost and you hear us when we cry for help. Your heart is for those who are distressed, those who are troubled. Be with those who are afraid and alone, those who are grieving, loved ones who suffer or who have died, or those who are close to death. Send your spirit of comfort into all of these situations. We pray now for those who suffer. Be close to those who are afraid. Your commands are good and merciful, O Lord, and so that we ask that you would give us courage to take a hold of your promises. Help us, Lord, to be a people who work for justice and give voice to the voiceless. Help us to be a people, Lord, who support others in body, mind, and spirit. Give us tongues that encourage and speak truth and grace. Keep us from tearing one another down or speaking ill of others. Bring us close to your heart, O Lord. Trusting in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your care. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Open our eyes, Lord. 
lesson is from St. John's Gospel, the 14th chapter, as we continue with our Lord's sermon in John's Gospel here. Jesus said to the disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord prays to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of Truth, our Advocate. Amen. For some of us, this season of stay-at-home orders has been about holding our breath, waiting anxiously for some good news, for something to give, something to change. Maybe it's a new job or a loan or the refinancing to go through or unemployment benefits to finally kick in. For others, this season has been about stopping to catch our breath putting life on pause, hitting the reset, worried about the future, sure, but also maybe appreciating a slower pace, more time with family, new attention to old hobbies and languishing home improvement projects. Still others have felt short of breath or even out of breath altogether. Exhausted, overextended, running to catch up, meeting new demands, always having to adapt to new situations and new information. Or maybe just plain missing human contact, missing mobility and the outdoors, those other kinds of breaths of fresh air. Whether you're holding it or catching it or just fresh out of breaths today, I believe that God's word has something to impart to us through the farewell sermon that our Lord preached to his fledgling church on the night of his betrayal. So take a deep breath and listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Having earlier told his friends that where he is headed, they cannot go, Jesus now reassures them that he will ask his father and the father will send another advocate, another helper, another true friend. Now, at first blush, we might think, as those first followers might very well have thought, how is this an improvement? Certainly from their perspective, this hardly sounds like a fair exchange. They have God already in the flesh, standing in their midst. They have seen him, touched him, supped with him. What need have we for another helper? They must be asking themselves. You are good enough. Well, Jesus anticipates this question and consoles them with good news. You already know him. 
he tells his own. You know him because he is making his home right here. And very soon he will be making his home in here, in you and in your fellowship. Well, we are two weeks out from the Feast of Pentecost when we will celebrate the Holy Spirit's coming into this fellowship that we call the church. But in this moment, our Lord is preparing his fishermen for a sea change, which is what a good friend does. If they see a storm on the horizon, they warn them about it. If a wind is liable to blow them over, they tell their friends, get out of the way, right? Only what's so interesting is the storm and the wind are two separate things here, right? Our Lord is indeed warning them about his impending death. But this is no warning he's giving them about the coming wind, because the coming wind is no storm. But it is the very breath of God, a God who loves his own too much to leave them where he finds us, a God who loves us too much to leave us unprepared or unaccompanied. It's an amazing thing if you stop to think about it, really. It's an idea which strains credulity that each one of our Lord's disciples should have the privilege of looking God in the face, of hearing the Son of God snoring in the back of the fishing boat. That's how near they have gotten to God standing so close that they have felt his hot breath on their face. How is this so, Philip asks back in John chapter 14, verse 8. We haven't seen the heavenly Father, so show us, he pleads. And what does Jesus say? You have beheld the Father, because you have seen the Son. And again, in today's lesson, the same theme played in a different key. Now our Lord is preparing them for his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, and the coming of this new advocate, the Holy Spirit. Well, just six chapters later, John will recount his own version of Pentecost, when Jesus will breathe on the disciples and say to them, receive the Holy Spirit. In this recapitulation of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, where God breathed on Adam and gave him life, now the disciples receive spiritual life from Jesus in John's rich vision of a new creation. And this is what our Lord is preparing his disciples for when he says in his sermon today, on that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. You know him, our Lord says, because he is abiding with you, but soon he will be in you. You thought God was close in the voice you heard by your side in the hot breath you felt on your face. Soon that word, that breath, will enter you, will impart life to your soul and animate the body of Christ with the very spirit of God. God's ruach in the Hebrew or pneuma in the Greek, God's life imparting breath, this divine wind that blows his church out into the world to spread the gospel and befriend the lonely and uplift the oppressed. But we're not there yet. Pentecost is still two weeks away, and we're still in that room where our Lord celebrated Passover, that room where he was betrayed by a friend and knelt to wash his disciples' feet and gave them the command to love one another. We are also still in our rooms, still waiting with bated breath for the news that we can go out without great risk. But to what end? If you belong to Jesus Christ and his church, if you believe that God has equipped you by the waters of baptism and the seal of his Holy Spirit, then what is all this for? When Bethlehem's doors open wide again and the Spirit calls us back into close fellowship, what kind of people will we have become in our time apart? What kind of people will the Spirit send back out into this world through those same doors? having been gathered once again around word and sacrament. Jesus is clear with his disciples. This new advocate, this new friend, is not a new God, but the same God. 
ensuring that the divine breath accomplishes all for which the Father has purposed it, ensuring that there is continuity between what God has been, what God is, and what God will be doing through you and me and in our life together. This whole farewell sermon is about Jesus saying, I love you. What we have is a true friendship, and I have to go now. But I won't leave you orphaned or friendless or alone, for I have asked my Father to send you another true friend. And here I take a cue from Frederick Bruner, who in his magisterial commentary in the Gospel of St. John, points out that a true friend is the one who stays with us when everyone else walks out. And a true friend is the one who advocates for us, encourages us, lifts our spirits. But you know what else a true friend is? She's the one who confronts us when we're in the wrong. She's the one who calls us out when we're doing harm to ourselves or another. She's the one who convicts us of our sin, who tells the truth in a way that we can hear it. That's our advocate, our true friend. That's the spirit of truth. So whether we're holding our breath or catching it or feeling fresh out of breath today, I wonder, do we realize that God is still breathing in us and through us? And do we understand that in this time, no less than in any other time, God is breathing life into his church? What will it look like? How will this change us? And maybe the most important question of all, where do we see God's spirit already at work? Not in some imagined future or faraway past, but right now, right here, in the fears and the doubts and the frustration, how is God breathing in us and through us? Where is he pointing out our sin and calling us to repentance? Where is he speaking comfort to our troubled heart, bringing us peace and joy through his spirit? The Eastern Orthodox tradition has long accused the West, Catholics and Protestants of the West, uh, of largely forgetting the Holy Spirit in our prayer, in our theology, in our practice of the Christian faith. And certainly we see within Protestantism movements to stress the work and the person of the Holy Spirit. We see this in the various uh, Pentecostal movements or charismatic Christian movements. These traditions, of course, celebrate and focus often on the Holy Spirit, but many of them uh, also affirm the Holy Trinity. And I think it's important for us to remember that we, too, have the Holy Spirit. We Lutherans may talk so much about Jesus Christ that we do sometimes neglect to think about and honor and pray to the third person of the Trinity. But in the creeds of the church, we do confess our belief in the Holy Spirit who draws us further into the mutual embrace of the Father and the Son. It's that divine fellowship, that trusting relationship toward which our true friend is leading us. And that's why Jesus tells his followers not to fret about their next breath. For it abides with you, our Lord says, and is already in you. In your prayers this week, in the times of silence, maybe too long or too few, in the longing of your heart for communion, for fellowship, listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and give thanks for God has not left us orphaned or friendless and as surely as the Son draws his breath from the Father and we breathe in the Son, so the Spirit breathes in us. And in him, we have become a new creation. Lord, help us to live in light of that newness and that freedom, even when we feel confined. In the name of the Father and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Accompanying this uh, video link in your email, I invite you to take a look at some information about uh, a virtual Bible study, men's Bible study that's going to be starting up. And uh, so again, check out that email for some more information if you are interested in participating in that. Otherwise, I send you out with our Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good.